This morning, King's Cross, would you stand to your feet and sing with us? Oh, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. Oh, I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my sin till I made you sing. You called my name. You called my name, and I ran. church. Sing, I needed rescue. Oh, I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is in some praise this morning. You all can have a seat. It's good to see you. I am Scott Claybrook, the lead pastor here at King's Cross, and we are so grateful that you are a part of us this morning, that you are with us. Whether you are here in the building or joining us online, just know that we are grateful that you've chosen to spend part of your Sunday with us this morning. A few things to let you know. One, if you're visiting with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, just know that we are so glad that you are here. Uh, restrooms are at these doors to the side. There's also a welcome center out there where we've got folks who would love to get to know you after the service, tell you more information about King's Cross, get to know more about you, and see how your story and this church's story may be able to come together in the weeks ahead. 
Uh, also, please keep in mind, too, that um, with the holidays, there's lots of great things going on here in the life of our church. If you haven't already, let me encourage you to go to our website, kcc.church, and scroll down on the main page. You'll see a pretty big link where you can sign up for KC Online. That's our online um, sort of church hub where you can sign up to get connected. You'll get access to contact information for other folks in the church, and you'll get emails uh, from me and others throughout the week where you can stay up to date on everything going on in the life of our church. So we would love for you to be a part of that. And finally, let me just offer a word uh, of gratitude where uh, I want to say thanks to so many of you who continue to give faithfully to our mission and ministry here at the church. When you give, uh, you support so much, whether it's supporting worship, uh, our children and youth ministries, our local ministry partners, our missions agencies doing good work across our state and across the world. Uh, when you give, you are supporting so much kingdom work. So we believe that giving is not only important because it allows us to do kingdom work together with one another and with God, but we also believe it's important spiritual practice. Proverbs 18, 16 says that the gift uh, opens the way for the giver and ushers them into the presence of the great that there's something about giving, even just a small portion of what we have and who we are, that ushers us, that reminds us where those gifts come from. It reminds us of God's goodness and allows us to give a portion of that back to him and ushers us time and again into the presence of the great. If you're interested in taking that next step and partnering with us in that mission and ministry, let me just encourage you that you can give a lot of different ways. You can go online to our website, kcc.church slash give. There are our maroon giving boxes at the main entrances to the side. You can give through your bank's online bill pay or through the mail. Uh, there are lots of ways that you can do that. But just know that your gifts matter, that they support meaningful work here in this church and in this community and across our region, and that we believe those gifts matter, not only to the lives that are impacted, but they matter to God. So thank you to so many of you that give so faithfully. Will you join me as we pray? God, we come this morning, we come this morning to worship you. As we've been studying your gospel, as we've been studying Matthew's words, we are reminded week after week of what a blessing it is, what a privilege it is, not only that you are our king, but that you choose to be a king called Emmanuel, God with us. We don't want to take that for granted. And so today as we come to the conclusion of that gospel, where we pause to stop, remember, and celebrate the resurrection, we celebrate the promise made and the promise kept that even death could not hold you back. Even death could not keep you from us because you are Emmanuel, God with us. And so that in the resurrection, you defeat death. You defeat finality. You defeat isolation. You defeat brokenness. You defeat separation. And in you and through you, we find hope. We find restoration. We find redemption and salvation. You are the resurrection and the life. And so we come to you this morning seeking a taste of that resurrection, seeking to be reminded again that in you and through you there is abundant life and there is life everlasting. And so we come offering all that we are, whether our week was a good one or a bad one, whether we have had some high highs or low lows, whether at the mountaintop or the valley of the shadow, wherever we find ourselves, we know that no place is beyond you, no place is too far from you. And so we would ask that you would come and be Emmanuel with us today. Come and meet us in this place. Renew us, guide us, sustain us, and save us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. It's this first song we're gonna do. Um, it's a new one for our church. It's been out for a little while, though. You may have heard it. Um, and it's what I would call a, a battle song. Um, one thing we don't talk enough about, probably, with worship is that worship is a weapon. Um, 
It says in James chapter 4 that the enemy flees in the presence of our Father, of our King. And when we're singing his name, um, it is a weapon against darkness. And man, 2020 has been full of that from my perspective, um, in my family, in our, in our lives. There's been a lot of darkness. There's been a lot of stuff that um, we feel like is just coming at us trying to, trying to take over. And so this song, um, I just want to offer it to you this morning. Um, if you find yourself just in a season of darkness right now, um, just in a place where you feel like the enemy is just attacking, just trying to, trying to get in, like, one, I want to reassure you, like, our God's already won. He's already won the war. Um, and so we can sing confidently and sing out his name. And in the song it says, um, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Like, he is a light in the darkness. And so I just want to give you these words this morning as we sing this. Um, if you find yourself just in a place of darkness right now, just sing this out as a weapon against the enemy. Sing this out as just proclaiming the truth that um, Jesus is bigger, that he's stronger um, than whatever it is that we find ourselves in this morning. So just sing this with us. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you made the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to me. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. The shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lived in high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome with that church your name your name is a light forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome we sing your name your name is a light that the shadows can't deny
Jesus, Jesus. We sing his name, we sing his name. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. For your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome let's sing that again your name your name is a light that the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is a light for Shadows can't deny Silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Sing his name, sing his name. It's you that rescued us, Lord. It's you that rescued us, Lord. How great the chasm that stands between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation. I turned to him and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Yeah. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, 
Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Let's sing together. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe, and out of the silence, the roaring light declared the grave has no claim on me. The darkness can't win, we've already won. Let's sing it again. He came, then came the morning. That seal the promise, your very body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Sometimes I think it's easy to forget that we serve a risen God. A God that's defeated death. That's already gone before us. He's already won the war. And he's walking with us. He's with us in the midst of all of our trials, all of our troubles. He's here. He's a light in the darkness. He's a light that can't be burned out. Let's sing this verse one more time. Let's just proclaim these words together. And then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared.
God, we just proclaim that truth this morning. God, that you are a living hope. God, in the midst of whatever we're walking through in life, God, I pray that we can just sing out your name. That we can sing, Jesus, Jesus. That the enemy flees in your presence. God, let us live knowing that we serve a risen God, a God that's already won. A God that is bigger and stronger than anything that we are walking through right now. God, we thank you for your presence in this place. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, today is our last week in the Gospel of Matthew. The last time we'll get to watch that intro video uh, and uh, turn through the pages of Matthew's Gospel. If you've got a copy of Scripture, if you want to turn or swipe and head on over to Matthew 28, we're going to be uh, reading that last chapter together, which is the resurrection story. We'll be focusing on the last few verses, the last few words of Jesus, which will likely be familiar to you as well. It's the Great Commission. Um, And as, you know, we were, as we'll talk about today, and as we've spent the morning singing about the resurrection, uh, if you're like me, sometimes we come to these pivotal or foundational moments in the gospel story and scripture whether it's the cross from last week, the resurrection this week. Uh, next week is the start of Advent. So we start it all over again, back to baby Jesus, right? And there's a part of me that sometimes can feel like uh, here we are again, back to the resurrection, back to Jesus, back to basics, back to the fundamentals. And sometimes uh, it can be a bit puzzling, um, particularly if we've been around a little bit to say, what am I supposed to learn this time? It's the same resurrection story. The words haven't changed over 2,000 years here in the gospel, but here we are talking about it again, singing about it again. What are we supposed to do with this? Why even, right, if we're being honest with ourselves? What is here for me this time? And I think that's a good question, and so I just want to preface our resurrection conversation with a little bit about that and talk sort of about worship in general. Worship and uh, this service and both this singing um, corporately together, the studying of scripture and the gospel story. What are we doing when we gather together to do this? It reminded me a little bit of uh, the holidays. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. Uh, some of you may be traveling. And it uh, got me thinking about some of the road trips that my family would take. Now, as I told you last week, if you're here last week, you heard me talk about when I was 13. I grew up in a generation that when I turned 13, when I became a teenager, one of the big rites of passage was you got a landline phone in your room, right? This was a big rite of passage. And then as I talked about, as a 13-year-old boy, I got the phone and then I didn't have anybody to call, right? There was, okay, that was great. Um, As a 13-year-old boy, I didn't spend a lot of time on the phone, but that was my rite of passage, right? That kind of dates me. Uh, the generation I grew up in, but when uh, I would go on road trips, I have an older sister, and I'm of the age that, you know, we didn't have TVs in the car, we didn't have iPads, we didn't have phones, right? This was the the stone age of car travel, right? And so what would you do? Now, I did grow up in a time where the hot ticket item, of course, was your Sony Discman, right? I spread the gap where I was younger, we had the Walkman tape, right, and then to the disc man, the CD, but that could only last you so long. You could only carry so many AA batteries with you on the road trip, and so you had to come up with other ways to entertain yourself, and it got me thinking about um, one of the, the games that my mom introduced my sister and I to was the license plate game. Did you guys ever play this, right? Where you'd go on a road trip, we would most often, um, my parents loved a vacation at the beach down in the Gulf, so if we ever took a trip, it was often 
down there. And so they would, my mom, um, who had an education background, you know, she would pl print out this one-page sheet with all the 50 states and give us on a clipboard and then say, watch the license plates, talk to you in eight hours, right? That was basically kind of the, um, the idea. And so my sister and I would be glued to the windows, right? watching the cars drive by, looking at the license plates. And of course, as you would find a new one, you could mark it on your list, sort of like a bingo type game. And that could last you the whole trip, not just the eight hours, eight, nine, 10 hours down there, but then the week at the beach and the drive back up, you'd see how many you could find, right? And uh, I remember a couple of our, our best trips, you know, we found close to 30, right? But you would get excited because you'd be looking out the window and you would try and lay eyes on every single license plate that would come by, right? Say, oh my gosh, there's, there's a New Mexico license plate. I've never seen one of those before. What's that one in the distance? That, is that a Pennsylvania maybe? Oh my gosh, can you believe it? That one's from Ontario, bonus points, right? You know, all this kind of stuff on the way down to Florida. And it reminded me that one of the uh, benefits of that was that it, it forced you to pay attention to every license plate. So not only did you see license plates that you may never have seen before, but you paid even more attention to the kinds of license plates that you would see on a daily basis, right? I never looked at so intently at so many Tennessee license plates than when I was playing that game. And so I think in some ways, uh, worship does that same thing for us. We're week after week, season after season, year after year, coming together reorients our attention. It allows us, by bringing the gospel story to mind, it opens our eyes to what is already around us. Just by playing the license plates game, I didn't make more cars appear on the road. It didn't change the fact that that New Mexico license plate was going to drive down the road one way or the other. The only difference was, was I going to pay attention enough to see it? The change was not in the road. The change was not what was happening outside. The change was in me, right? Eyes to see, ears to hear that a significant portion of what we do, why we believe it's so important, why I spend my life, my vocation, my career doing this, is that I believe there's something inherently powerful and transformative about the people of God gathering together for the worship of God and to be transformed by God. That when we gather together and sing the songs of resurrection, when we read and study the resurrection story, it reminds us week after week, year after year, that resurrection is around us, right? So not only does it refocus our attention to catch that one in a million uh, Vermont license plates driving through rural Alabama, but it also causes us to appreciate and pay attention to the Tennessee license plates that are there day by day. So it's not enough just to hear it once and move on but it's a way of life. It's an integration into our life. And so part of what I want us to talk about this morning not only is to simply hear and sing the resurrection story again, it's part of the gospel, but uh, to see if perhaps there's some different ways we can look at it, different perspectives we can gain from it, but even if there is not, even if you don't hear another word that is new to you or a thought or perspective that is new to you, that's okay it's still worthwhile because it is worthy and transformative for us to build a rhythm of life that reminds us of the resurrection. Because as we'll see today, there is life, there is transformation, there is redemption happening all around us. The question is, will we have those eyes to see or ears to hear? So I hope that's encouraging to you. It's encouraging to me because it reminds me that I need it, and that this is worthy work for us to do together. So, if you have a copy of Scripture, let me read for us together. Matthew 28, I'll read verses 1 through 20, that's the whole chapter, but I want us to pay particular attention 
to the last few verses, the Great Commission, which will be familiar to many of us. Just two quick things to remind you, right in our big story, we've been talking about all of Matthew's gospel, right? This is the gospel of the king, Matthew's uh, fundamental metaphor all the way through the gospel of Matthew is that Christ is the king, that he is called both Yeshua, Yahweh saves, and his kingly name that he receives all the way back in Matthew 1, Emmanuel, God with us. And that he is the son of God and the son of David, right? He has this dual sort of kingly identity twice over. But that also keep in mind that Matthew's fundamental worldview is that the world is in conflict between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven. That there is Christ the king who is being opposed by other forces. Whether it is King Herod whether it is Satan the deceiver, throughout the gospel, Matthew is convinced that the world is in conflict. And what Jesus is doing is Christ the King, as Emmanuel, God with us, as he is coming to bring transformation to that world. But Matthew's gospel also challenges us, encourages us to be vigilant. And that we need to not only grow in our wisdom and understanding and our hope in the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ the king but we need to be mindful and discerning and wary of the forces of this other kingdom that's what we'll talk about today so this is the end the end of the story of Christ the king and this is what Matthew's gospel has to say this is early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You'll see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. But Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say that Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said that what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews and they still tell it today. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's it. The end. Now, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of really great teaching material here, right? This is the stuff that, you know, preachers dream of, right? Some of these sentences are so rich, so beautiful, so evocative, you can just pick one out, right? I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Come see where his body was laying. Go quickly. Tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you to Galilee, right? We could spend all morning just talking about that. Jesus is the one that goes ahead of us. 
Jesus is the one who defeats death. Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for. Jesus is the one who tells us, don't be afraid. Jesus is the one who's standing there waiting for us. The world are the ones that want to corrupt the story. The world is the one who wants to bribe us, seduce us away from the truth. The world is the one who feels threatened by the hope and transformation of Jesus, right? All of these things we could spend our morning together talking about. But what I want to draw us attention to this time, won't be the last time we talk about the resurrection, but this time what I want to draw our attention to are the very last words of Jesus. Look with me again at verse 18, just 18, 19, and 20. When Jesus and the disciples finally come together, he says, I have been given all authority, the same word for power, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am the one, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So there's a few things where when we look at this, if you've perhaps been around church or if you, like me, grew up in a Baptist church deeply focused on missions, you heard the Great Commission from an early, early age, right? Thank you, Women's Missionary Union, right? Thank you, VBS. Thank you, uh, Mission Friends, all these different mission organizations that look for, that find meaning and anchoring here in Jesus' great commission. But it's so simple, really. It's so powerful that it's easy for us to hear it and almost blow right by it, right? Jesus says, hey, it's me. I've defeated death. I've been given all authority, and here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them what I've told you to do, and be sure of this. I'm with you. It's so simple. It's so straightforward and we have perhaps been exposed to it so often that it's easy to push right by it. But I think, in fact, it is worth us stopping, looking with fresh eyes, looking deeper together, because I believe the Great Commission informs not only who you and I are as men and women, who you and I are as sons and daughters of the King, but it informs who we are as King's Cross as a church. So let me show you what I mean. Let's break it apart, okay? Verse by verse. Verse 18, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus starts this last sort of blessing, this last commissioning from a place of power. And this is deeply important, again, as Christ the risen king comes not as one defeated, but as a conquering king. One who has overcome death, and in the process, kept his promise. I am the one that will be with you. Death, for him and for all of us, is what? Meant to be a separation. Meant to be the end of the story. Meant to be the final isolation between God and humanity. And yet, it is Jesus who overcomes that. And so it is from this place that Jesus has been bestowed with, right? Jesus has been given all authority. The same word, you can translate it either way. All power in heaven and on earth. So what's about to come comes not from a place of weakness, not from a place of grasping or an attempt to somehow uh, fix what was broken on the cross, but Jesus says, what I am about to tell you comes from a place of victory, that I have all the power to do all the things. Remember all the way back in Matthew 4, what Satan tried to promise me was going to be mine? The kingdoms of the world, the love of the Father, all those things I have done, and I have done it the right way. And so with my power, this is what I choose to do, which in and of itself is interesting. What does he choose to do with his power? Verse 19, therefore... Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Again, so straightforward, so simple. The way that Jesus speaks here, the way that it's constructed in the text is the uh, imperative. You, go. You must do this. But if we take it at face value, these simple words, we, we lose some things in English. So let me tell you about this. The, the two verbs there, go and make disciples. If we could read it in the real, original language, what we would actually see and hear Jesus telling us is much more textured, much richer. Because what Jesus is saying in there is to say, look, I have come to you after defeating death. I have fulfilled my promise that I will be with you that nothing, not even death, can separate us. And that from this place of power, from this place of victory, this is what I want you to do. And that the, the word there for go is true, it's accurate, but what he actually is saying, the true literal sense of the word is he says, therefore, now begin your journey. Now begin your journey. It's not a simple, basic you go. Go just forever. Go to some undescribed location. But he says, therefore, begin your journey. And as he takes the next step and he says, therefore, go on your journey and make disciples, what he literally says there in that moment is, go on your journey and cause others to become disciples. Literally, what Jesus says is, therefore, go and begin your journey, causing others to become disciples along the way. This is incredibly important because one of the dangers for you and for me is to take the Great Commission as another box on our checklist of life. To simply say, I am supposed to go somewhere, maybe to the ends of the earth, right? I'm supposed to go somewhere and make disciples, is that if I can push someone through a system, through a process, through a program, they should pop out the other side as a disciple. But what Jesus begins to say is, no, no, no. What I want you to do is to go. Go about your journey. Go about your life. But go about it in such a way that you cause other people to become followers of me. This great commissioning, this missional journey is not a sliver of who we are supposed to be as the hands and feet of Christ. It's not one little part of what it means to be sons and daughters of the king. What Jesus is saying is, look, I've won. The kingdom is coming. The power of resurrection is here, and it's time to get on with your life. Wherever that life takes you, whether it's to the ends of the earth or whether you never leave Tullahoma again, get on with your life. Begin your journey. Embark on what is ahead of you. But whatever you do, however you do it, do it in such a way that it causes people to become disciples. And I love this because what it reminds us is that we don't have the power to make someone become a follower of Jesus. What a mistake that is for us. What arrogance that is for us. But really what Jesus is saying is my last request of you, my last commission to you, is that you live in such a way that it invites others, it encourages others, it entices others to know more to hear more, to see more, to feel more, to become curious that you might lead others into an encounter with me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Important here. Jesus opens up. Remember, up to this point, Jesus has been working exclusively with the Jewish population. And now that authority and power has come to him, he's opened it up to the whole world, to Gentiles like you and me, right? Right? Go and make disciples of all nations. And this is, I think, the key for us. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is, I think, for the Great Commission, the great pivot point. 
But he says, therefore, go and begin your journey. Live your life. Live in such a way that invites people, that entices people to become disciples. And as they do, baptize them into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we could spend uh, all month sort of exploring the Trinitarian idea here. This is one of the few places in the New Testament that mentions Father, Son, Holy Spirit together in the same breath. The word Trinity is never used, but that's a word that came uh, in the years um, following the New Testament to describe this kind of relationship that God is three persons in one. But this is the part that I want us to remember this morning what's so critical for our identity individually and for our identity together. That as we become disciples, as we become followers of Jesus, we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism becomes for us a holy identity with a holy purpose. Baptism is for us a holy identity with a holy purpose. That's why even today, we still baptize people here at King's Cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in death with Jesus, raised to walk in the newness of life. For many of us, we maybe have heard those things as we were going under, right? Holding our breath, saying, please don't let me drown, Jesus, right? You know, whatever those fears are that we have, as baptism is happening, but we have been baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and words cannot overstate how critical that is, because to be baptized into that is to move our allegiance from whatever king or kingdom there is into the kingship of the Trinitarian God that we are baptized not only into the name of the Trinity, but into the work of the Trinity. That it's not merely some old way of talking about the persons of God, of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but we are talking about being baptized into what? Into the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. That what it means for us to be commissioned into the world, what it means for us to be sent to go, to begin the journey, to go and make disciples is to be baptized, to be moving, to be working as the hands and feet of the Trinity. (coughs) To be baptized into the work of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Eric Peterson is a (coughs) uh, wonderful pastor who's working in um, Washington State outside of Tacoma. He's the son of Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, and he has a wonderful way of saying that, reminding us of the the two kingdoms that are at work in the world. There's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit here. And then there's the kingdom of darkness, right? The kingdom of the world, the kingdom of brokenness, in a way. And so if the trinity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit is the trinity of the kingdom, then what's the trinity of the other? What's the temptation of the other? What's the lordship of the other? He says that uh, throughout much of perhaps all human history, but definitely in our current history, that the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is opposed by the trinity to produce, consume, and acquire. That the trinity of the kingdom is the creator, redeemer, sustainer, and the trinity of the kingdom of the world is production, consumption, and acquisition. Let me tell you why that's important. Because at the end of the day, the trinity, the very idea at the bedrock of our faith is that God is fully God when God exists in relationship. That one God in three persons God is relationship. And so when you and I are baptized into the Trinity, we are baptized into relationship. We are baptized into a king that says, it is not good for man to be alone. 
but that the Trinity tells us that the redemptive work of God happens in relationship. It happens slowly. It happens through personal vulnerability. It happens through transparency. It happens in the slow, redemptive way of God. And it is challenged by the kingdom of darkness, by a trinity, by a God, by an idolatry that rejects all personality, that rejects all kinds of relationship and instead does what? It privileges the impersonal. It privileges commodities. It privileges acquisitions. It privileges isolation, whether we realize it or not. And so to choose the way of Jesus, to choose the Great Commission, to choose the Trinity is fundamentally a rejection that says what I produce, consume, and acquire will not define me. Why? Because my identity and my purpose comes from another baptism. It comes from another trinity. I choose the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not only their historical presence in the world, but their redemptive work in the world. I choose to define my life not by what I produce, consume, or acquire, but I choose to define my life by the work of creation, redemption, and sustaining the work of God in the world. That is what the Great Commission is all about. And so for us, church, we have to ask ourselves, how well are we following that Trinitarian commission? Jesus ends his great commission by saying, once you've done this, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. Be sure of this, he says, I am still Emmanuel. Be sure of this, I am still with you. Be sure of this, I keep my promises. Be sure of this, I'll be here until the very end, the very end of the age. So it's the power of Jesus that sends us, it's the presence of Jesus that sustains us. But at the core of what we have to fight, the battle you and I are in the midst of, between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven, between the kingdom of brokenness and the kingdom of wholeness, is fundamentally the question of what sort of trinity are we following? Because if we're honest with ourselves, if I'm honest with you, these forces over here that want to draw my attention to what I produce, to what I have, what I consume, what I can acquire, they are deeply seductive, right? If we're really honest with ourselves, right, we know that there's a deep part of us that says, I need to be busy. I need to be achieving. I need to be succeeding. I need to be earning. I need to be acquiring. I need to be winning, right? Or is that just me? There's a part of me that says, I need to prove my worth. I need to pull my weight. I need to uh, earn my keep. I need to do all of these things which justify my worth, which justify my value, that secures my belonging, right? And so there's a part of us, even as a church, where we say, well, gosh, what are we doing? How are we justifying ourselves as a church, right? How are we uh, achieving? How are we growing? How are we acquiring? How are we building? How are we doing all of these things? And I am more and more convinced the, the longer I sit with Jesus' great commission, these things are not inherently bad, but if they become the end rather than the means to an end, then we've lost our way. Because I am convinced, church, that what the great commission says to me that all of our doing is in service to our becoming. 
that all of our doing must be in service to our becoming. Jesus, of course, goes and does miraculous things, heals people, serves people, feeds people, does all of these things, but it is always, always, always in service to what? To a deeper, transformative relationship. And one of the great seductions of this world of darkness, this world of brokenness, the world that says you are what you do, you are what you earn, you are what you acquire, all of those things are fundamentally impersonal. They take people and they turn them into commodities. That at its core, the Trinity, at its core, the kingdom of God, at its core, the resurrection rejects that and says, I am the one that is with you. I am the one that loves you. I am the one that wants to what? Have a relationship with you. And I think one of the ways that the church at large has lost its way is that we've looked at the Great Commission and been so consumed with this idea to just need to go and make that if we just have the right materials, if we just have the right missional strategy, if we just have the right leaders in the right place, then everything's going to work out. And so what we've told everybody is that we have, hey, good news. The Savior of the world wants to have a relationship with you. I don't. There's this fundamental disconnect that says the gospel is about relationship, but we're so busy trying to justify our belonging, justify our, our needs, justify our worth, our strategies, or whatever, that we can't be bothered to bring the good news in and through relationship ourselves. So church, one of the things we are doing as a body is working to live more intentionally into this idea of being a church that is blessed and sent into that baptism. That we want to be a church that advocates from your first day here until your last, that we believe transformation happens through relationship. We want to be a church that says we choose to go the slow way rather than the fast We choose to go the personal way, even when it's messy, instead of the impersonal. We want to build things, we want to do things, we want to develop things, but always, always, always in service to relationship. There's a lot of things we can do, there's a lot of things we can do better, and there's a lot of hard work being done to make that happen, but always, 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 it should be in service to relationship. It should be in service to the Trinity. It should be in service to the work that you and I are baptized into, creation, redemption, sustaining the work of Father, Son, and Spirit. And so when we talk about our witness together, sharing our faith, which is really what the Great Commission is all about, go wherever your journey takes you. Whether it's across the country to go to college, around the world for your job, or if it's to be in Tullahoma the rest of your life, wherever you go, you are being sent by the Savior of the world to bring the good news of redemptive relationship with you in all that you do. And so I believe that when we talk about witness, when we talk about bringing the gospel to the nations, witness for us should always be a form of withness. Our witness should always be a form of withness. So over the coming uh, weeks and months, we'll get to share with you ways that we as a congregation are growing, are headed in this direction. I was in a meeting this week uh, with several of our our leadership teams talking about our our budget for next year and ways that we can strategically invest in the area of discipleship and mission. And I couldn't have been more excited about those conversations. We're on track to wrap up our budget process here soon. We'll get to share that with you probably uh, maybe the second week of December. Um, 
And I couldn't have been more excited, more thrilled about the ways that we can make substantive, large investments in that work in the years to come. But I left that conversation more convinced than ever that we feel called to a form of ministry rooted in relationship. That whatever we build, whatever we do, however we go about it, we want to be a church that chooses personal over impersonal, intimate over anonymity, slow over fast, organic over processed, people over programs. That's the sort of church that we want to be. And I think for us, at least for me, I think that allows us to be faithful to who God is calling us to be. So, this is my challenge for you this week. That's a lot of slow, hard, uh, sometimes tedious work. And we'll talk about how we're going about that and doing that in ways that all of us can be involved in that. But there's a couple of things I just want you to keep in mind as you go this week, as you head into Thanksgiving. Um, whether uh, you're able to have Thanksgiving in person or you have to do it by a distance, all of us are going to be uh, perhaps invited into some kind of deeper relationship, right? And the temptation is we all sort of navigate or survive the holidays in different ways, but the temptation is what? To, to sort of roll through these holiday seasons always at a distance, always keeping ourselves at arm's length, right? Don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. You know, the list grows and grows and grows and eventually you've got the weather and the number of leaves that have fallen in the yard, right? That's about all that you've got left. But the gospel invites us to another way. Our salvation invites us to another way. Resurrection invites us to another way. So, two things. One, what I don't want you to hear is that the Great Commission is something for the handful of full-time international missionaries. It's not for a portion of a portion of a portion. The Great Commission is for all of us. Wherever life takes us, Jesus says, go, start the journey. And as you do it, live in such a way to make disciples, to cause people to come into the kingdom. That's for all of us. So don't feel like Jesus isn't speaking to you because Jesus is speaking to all of us and to our church. But my challenge for you this week is to choose one person. You can choose. Maybe it's someone that it's uh, easy to be with. Maybe it's somebody that's difficult to be with. Maybe it's someone that you know well or someone that you don't know well at all. Maybe it's someone in the midst of a large family gathering or someone in your life that you know will be alone this week and struggling with that aloneness. But my challenge to you this week is that you would find one person and choose to be with them this week. What does that mean? It means that you choose the personal. It means that you listen well, it means you move towards vulnerability and transparency. It means that you reject this idea that depersonalizes people. And just see what happens. Wherever your journey takes you, whether you're leaving town or not, whether you're at home alone or not, wherever life takes you, live in such a way to invite people into the kingdom work into the kingdom life, into the resurrected life. I'm gonna invite our worship team back up as we get ready to uh, end our time together. We'll get one last chance to sing together to remind one another about the resurrection. And as we're doing that, my invitation to you, my challenge for me, is that we remember that it's the resurrected king, it's Christ the king that comes to us and says, 
I want you to take what you have. Take this hope. Take this good news. Take this resurrected life. Take this new identity being baptized into the Trinity. Take all that you've been given and use it for someone else. It's pretty interesting to me what's not here at the end of the gospel. There's not a promise of an easy path. There's not a promise of a carefree life. There's really nothing but a focus for the disciples on those who don't yet know Jesus. To the ends of the earth. Create, redeem, sustain. Father, Son, Spirit. I don't know about you, but I needed that reminder. I needed that challenge, and I'm excited. I think we can be these people. I think we can be that church that even if it causes us to go slow, even if it causes us to look a little different or sound a little different or go about things in a little different way, one, that's nothing new for King's Cross, right? But two, I I think there's something right. I think there's something true that at the end of the day, we get to where Jesus is calling us. We just get there in a little bit different way. So as we get ready to sing, remember your baptism. Remember that holy identity and that holy purpose. Remember that your witness is rooted to your withness. Remember the good news that Jesus wants a relationship with you and asks us to have a relationship with one another. Let's stand together and sing. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, for Jesus paid it all, all to him I yield. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed you white as snow. And Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone. Can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I yield. For sin had left a crimson stain, he washed. You white as snow He washed you white as snow And when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat oh Jesus paid it all all to him I yield for sin had left a crimson stain he washed you white as snow yes jesus paid it all all to him i yield my sin 
had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Yes, he washed it white as snow. paid it all, all to him I yield. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed you white as snow. Let's sing that one more time. For Jesus paid it all, all to him I yield. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed you white as snow. If you want to know more about who this Jesus is that lived, died, and lived again for you, if this is a story that's new to you, these words of meaning and belonging and commissioning are new. Come find me. Find anybody on this stage. Ask the people next to you in your seat. We would love to tell you the story of this Jesus who paid it all, who loved you so much, not because of who you are or what you've done, not because of what you've achieved or what family you're a part of, but who just loved you for you. Come find us. We'd love to tell you more about him. For those of you that know the story, for those of you who've taken that step, who've entered into this kingdom life, who've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the creator, redeemer, sustainer, my prayer for you is that you would leave feeling this great commissioning all over again. That you would choose this radical, weird, hard way of life that chooses relationships, that chooses intimacy, that chooses the riskiness of love over the temptation to produce, the temptation to earn, the temptation to acquire. Because in this resurrection, in this salvation life, there's freedom. Freedom to be, freedom to live, freedom to love. 
So as you go this week, church, may you go hearing these words from the Apostle Paul to his friends in Galatia. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. As you go this week, may you have safe travels, good times, and good rest. And may you get to live into a relationship of freedom, born not from who you are or what you do, but born out of the God that loves you. Go in peace. Go in freedom. Amen.